Do you really think that the issues around your hair and you embracing the more natural you, whether it be an afro, twist, sister locks, micro locks, traditional locks, freeform locks, or whatever else, do you feel that the majority of the issues that you experience come more from outside of your community or within your community? A house divided does fall. Let's hear what, what Dr. Cornwell has to say. I am Melanin Magic, and so are you. Experience the I Am Melanin Magic difference by going to our website, www.iammelaninmagic.com. and Potpourri, the channel where we get it all in. You can also learn more about the I Am Melanin Magic brand. Thank you for stopping yeah, by. Rocks. Welcome to the Today channel. Welcome I to Tunisia's Locks, Beauty Tips and Potpourri. Everyone, it is Wednesday night and we're getting back on track with that hair thing by Sister Joanne Cornwell. We are going through this book bit by bit to get a sense of the woman who, whose genius is behind the movement, or she was an important catalyst in the movement towards us claiming our natural hair proudly and boldly all over the place, all over the globe, and the creator of the sister locks okay now as you know we tackle a little bit at a time and we're actually in chapter three a small section here that i wanted to go over this is a wonderful a wonderful segment that i've read uh and, and i really want to go into it and share it with you i'm not sure where you can get this book i believe it's out of print but you can get my book, <laughs> Manifesting Your Masterpiece. It's not out of print. And if I was Mrs. Cornwell, I would make sure my book was not out of print. That's something that does give me a big question mark. Why is this book so hard to find and why is it out of print? But this is our attempt to, to get some insight into this individual. Uh, since oftentimes it's been hard to hear her voice. So anyway... I want to start at the end because one of the things she talks about is making it over. And she ends with saying we can love ourselves openly when we can love ourselves openly and claim our right as individuals and standardize in our own minds, our own sense of beauty. And this is my summative uh, assessment. This is not verbatim. Then we've made it over. And she addresses issues in these few pages that have to do with looking deeper at the subconscious beliefs that we have about ourself and, and, and comparing that with a need to look at where is the problem really? Uh, is it with those people who have standardized beauty and have uh, found us inferior or coming up short? Is that where the problem is in the workplace and in in um, the bigger, larger world, or is it within ourselves in the way that we feel about ourselves? And this need uh, to have a victim mentality or this, this situation of having a victim mentality. And I totally resonated with that because I'm really big on understanding our history, knowing why we are the way that we are. I think a lot of us don't know some of the post-traumatic slave stress syndrome, some of the effects, some of the PTSD that we have genetically inherited, and that that is oftentimes a huge culprit in the experiences that we have, and it cannot be negated. But, but at the same time, I believe that we do ourselves a disservice if we focus so much on what has not been possible based upon societal norms or societal uh, systemic um discrimination and so forth and so on, if we internalize those and we continue to internalize that trauma and pass that down, ultimately that is what is going to strip us uh, of our humanity. Well, let me put it this way. It's going to strip us of our ability to um, correct our course or to take charge of our destinies. At some point, no matter what, we have to claim our right to be. We have to stand in our creative power. We have to have faith in our ability 
to master our fates and to determine our destiny, irregardless of what is going on around us. Because to continue to be in a victim mindset is to nurture a reality that is a disempowerment. And there's just been too many stories of people who come up from, I mean, I told you, I think I did this on my other channel. I did a, a video more recently about Wall Street Trapper. Like if you look at his story, orphan, parents, didn't know his father, um, uh, mother was killed. He was in jail uh, for selling drugs. He was homeless at 14. He was on the streets back out again and then shot someone six times. This man now is a tycoon. He's a testament. And if someone like that can say, listen, I came up during ABC era. This was, these were the trials, but I made a decision that I wanted something different and he went after it. When you look at that, it makes everything else pale in comparison. So rising above ourselves, but most importantly, being able to see where we ourselves can be part of the problem. So I'm going to just go through and paraphrase. She talked about the crimes that we commit against ourselves and how oftentimes some of these pressures regarding our hair, because as you know, in the previous sections, we talked a lot about not being accepted in the broader society, more specifically within our workplaces and having to be what we were not and the, the impact that that had on the psyche, on our psyches, and the impact that that has on a person's psyche. And having to standardize to an artificial, for us, I'm going to call it an artificial standard of beauty that was not us. And what that actually does. But then she goes on in chapter three, and she really talks about how sometimes the problems are closer to home. For example, she talks about, um, she's she had had women to tell her that, uh, one of the main offenders might have been their, and their, their pastor who sent them packing and sent them home uh, as they were trying to come into the church for service and said, uh, you know, basically, honey, you got to do something about that hair. Or the other uh, people in the family who were denigrating. So it's this form of self-denigration that she refers to as very detrimental and being actually a huge problem. And in the same way that we might want to prosecute or persecute racism, we have to realize that self-denigration is, is just as grave a crime and it has a, a tremendous impact on somebody. And if someone, for example, she gives in the book in your daughter's third grade classroom were to begin to criticize, denigrate, and make um, offensive comments about your daughter's hair, you'd be ready to take up arms. But when it happens within our own community, we don't see the insidious way that that undermines our sense of pride and our, our dignity. So I really had an appreciate about, appreciation about that. Um, she said, make no state, mistake about it. These are crimes against the person in the same way that a person might be victimized by racist attitudes. So she talks about this being huge and us needing to address this. And are we passing the buck by continuing to blame the reason why we don't embrace our beauty, our natural beauty and wear our styles proudly? Are we blaming that on something that, ex that exists but doesn't exist at the level that we are blaming it on? And she says something specifically that I think is really important. And I wanna quote that. Um, Oh gosh, it was a good a good point. But essentially she was saying it's got to be about more than what we think. Because if it wasn't, then uh, we would have women whose jobs were not on the line and who were not trying to get promotions and who were not afraid of their bosses. In, those, in positions where those were not issues, we would see them embracing their hair. And we're not. And so that proves that there's something deeper at the level of of what is going on here. And oftentimes um, we need to look a lot deeper. We need to look a lot deeper because many times it's not the, the disapproving eyes of the boss or someone in the workplace, because in reality, that could be more of a projection. You may actually be feeling that way, but if you were to change your hair and embrace your natural beauty, Who's to say anyone would even be concerned about what you quote unquote was look were looking like? So I think that's an important point. I really like that. This is an important set of pages. I believe we're, we're looking at pages 47. No, not 47. Uh, pages. 
49, yeah, 49 through um, 52. And she also talks about when she gets ready to um, reference Maya Angelou's poem, Still I Rise, and I'm going to read that. One of the things that she says that is so moving to her about that poem, especially the line, I am the dream and hope of the slave, that really does something to her because it speaks of people trying to make a way uh, where there was no way or where they felt that there was no way. And she said, what kept them dreaming more than likely was this idea that one day my, my uh, descendants, one day my progeny will be able to rise up long after I'm gone. And she says, quote, I imagine that what is keeping them going is the dream that one day long after they imagine themselves dead and gone, I will be born, me and she or you will be the ones to set things right. So they're counting on future generations, which is what gives them strength. And I really, really liked that. I really did. And I wanted to share that poem by Maya Angelou. And it says, still I rise. You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like the moons and like suns with the uncertainty of ties, just like the hope springing high, still I rise. Did you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard? Cause I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words. You may cut me with your eyes. You may kill me with your hatefulness, but still like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Out of the huts of history, shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. I belong to a, um, in this tiny little countryfied place, a um, book club. That's a trans um, or inter interracial book club. And, um, uh, we are uh, going to be, we're reading this book. Oh gosh, what is it called? Well, they, they think they had read White Fragility before I joined. I believe this book, I forget the name of it. I wish I could, I can't believe I can't think of the name. I can see it. Anyway, there's something we need to bring in to share next week. And I love this poem. I may actually do this. She wanted us to bring in something that is um, a poem or or a mantra, or something like that that you connect with. And I think that this is beautiful. Um, started out with three white women and three black women. She didn't want any more than six. We still have three black women. We have two white women uh, currently. But very interesting dialogue. And I remember bringing up a hair-related matter. Uh, maybe it was two months ago. And it was very shocking because, you know, they take these things for granted they don't understand what can be a very common part of our reality because it's not their reality. And so it's up to both people or both groups to honor the experience, um, to honor the light of the experience, the individual experience of each person so that we can, we can have these kind of dialogues. So it's a very interesting dynamic there, especially way down here in this country, 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 country town. Very interesting. But I loved this uh, reading here. And she talked about unlearning the victim mentality is an act of love and a journey back to oneself. And when you can unlearn that and embrace who you are, then you've made it over. And I really love that. I really love that. She talked about cultivating self-love, learning self-acceptance, which I just said, and unlearning the victim mentality that immediately causes us to assume they're after us. And that's something that you have to grapple with. And in the mindset work that I do, I can tell you, shifting out of that mindset in my 30s 
my late 30s, because it's taken me many years. I used to be an angry person into the mindset that I have today. I'm a lot more successful. My life is fairly stress free. I don't allow myself to get pulled in to the negativity the way that I used to. And I don't personalize every move that I make. And I have found my experiences far richer and that I'm much more powerful and empowered when I don't allow them to take my energy. And a shift in your worldview or a shift in your inner world is the only thing that brings about a shift in your outer world. So I could definitely... Um, Definitely, as she talked about this internalized racism, this this sort of sense that we have within our own selves that we need to address and really become more comfortable with being self-critical at the deeper levels. I think it's a dialogue worth talking about because we can do it in ways that we're not even aware of. And um, growing up in the family that I grew up in, where my parents were very active in the civil rights movement, my dad was a part of, they were first black Muslims, but they were not the first, but firstly, they were that. But then also they were, my dad was a part of the revolutionary action movement, which gave rise to the black power movement. And so you can imagine the way I grew up with a, a strong sense of pride and dignity, but also a strong sense of history. And sometimes in imparting that strong sense of history, you're also imparting uh, what is not possible. And it's only been through freeing myself of that that I have been able to be more of, I feel like, my divine self, what I was created to be. So that's just my opinion. Everybody feels differently. But I would love for you to add some comments in the comment section and tell me how you feel about her idea of the internalized racism that we have that sometimes happens is a form of oppression and self-denigration that happens closer to home from our families who may criticize our hair or that mother-in-law that you have that's always getting you the kitty perm to put in your daughter's hair or the pastor at the church that looks at you in a horrified manner and ushers you to go home and fix your hair or whatever it else, else that may be going on that is less coming from outside of our community but more coming from within the community. Even if you have a lover or a husband or a child in your family who's uncomfortable with your hairstyle or you know of a situation like that, someone who's uncomfortable with you having embraced your sister lock journey or whatever else it is that you may be doing uh, with your hair. And by the way, y'all, this is um, a door. This is just a rinse. It's carrying me until I can do the full uh, color. The um, Vidal Sassoon really red, which is not going to turn it like this, but it'll give me enough lift so that when I finally go henna in a year and a half, I won't be coloring anymore. I'll be able to have this color with henna, but I've got to lighten my hair. But anyway, um, I'd lo love for you to share some of your experiences and let me know what you think about the section and her views, but also what your own personal views are with regard to how you are interacting with um, this hair thing. Lots of love to you. I believe this is the fifth video. I had to get rid of the other three because I was reading them verbatim and there is a chance of some copyright infringement, especially when we're dealing with this particular individual. So I don't want to invite anything that could cause my channel to be shut down. It's just not worth it. So I figured I better do better to read it ahead and summarize and paraphrase and discuss it from that particular point of view. Lots of love to you guys. All right. Um, I will be offering a, what is it? 35 or 40% off 12 hour sale on Umsi. Okay. For those of you who are looking for a natural, uh, almost wholly authentic way of bringing in and burning resins and woods and ouds and other um, uh, musk-like uh, natural creations that come from either plants, seeds, essences, natural aromatics, shells from the seas, sap from trees, and all sorts of spices and just amazing natural aromatics to clear the energy in your home, to raise the vibration, to purify the air, to help romanticize and feminize your life. I'm going to offer a coupon code and I will put it in the community tab. All right. And you'll be able to order um, at a discount for extremely limited amount of time. It'll probably be the only 
one of two sales that I'll probably have this entire year with the Oomsie, but it is a superior product and there are various um, different ways that you can consume some of these smells. I don't even have them in here with me. I had them the other day, but we have Fragrance Putty, which allows you twice the burn. We have the original Umsi, which is the Somali variety, which is amazing. Uh, we also have the Fragrance Balls and a few other things that I've added. We have the orange flavor, ginger, vanilla, chai. Uh, there's also, um, uh, did I say vanilla? Vanilla, there's... Um, Lavender, which is increasingly becoming one of my favorite smells. And then the infamous white sage umsi, which is amazing. If you already like white sage, you're going to love this. So anyway, um, you can go to IamMelaninMagic.com uh, to look more into that. And I will see you again this weekend on Sunday. Continue to be your most beautiful, best self. Continue to be inspired um, and continue to be peaceful, productive, prosperous in your power and living passionately. And I'll see you around next time. Thank you so much. And I love you all. Thank you for all your support. Tantalizing, enticing, luxurious, and magnetic. Tunisia's aromatic umsi and bahor will entice you to find solace in each precious moment. Delight and enchant with your magic. Aromatize your intimate settings. Enhance your clarity. Cleanse the air. Purify your room of bacteria and stagnant energy or lift your mood. Relax away the day's stress and create a spiritual ritual. You can also use umsi to clear negative energy like you would with white sage or palo santo. Raise the vibe and lift your spirit. Feed your soul, create a luxurious bath, enhance the romance, and so much more. It's time for you to burn some Ootsie. Ootsie is an aromatic fragrance solid that comes in small nugget like rocks. Some are harder than others, but usually you can modify the size to your liking with a spoon or by breaking the pieces apart. It's been around since ancient times and was known to be used in many spiritual ceremonies to provide fragrance to the body and spaces as an aphrodisiac in many medicinal practices and to provide relief from stress and anxiety. All the aromatics and ingredients are natural and have their own separate and diverse health benefits. Untsi is made from the holy resin frankincense which Somalia is known for across the world. The most notable trees originate in a part of Somalia called Puntland. This floral essence is so concentrated that the smell lingers in a room long after the umsi has been burned and put away. Secret recipes within families have been passed down through generations and guarded. Each woman making umsi has her own style and quality. Although the classical characteristics of umsi are common to all regardless of origin. Umsi has so many therapeutic qualities. True to its name as aromatherapy, it can boast over 20 authentic ingredients including resins, sandalwood, oud chips, anyacha, tonka beans, frankincense, mirth, concentrated perfume oils, and various other natural essences and spices and more. You may burn it fast to quickly eradicate negativity or odors, and bacteria in your living space, or you may allow it to simmer using a potpourri pot and a tea light candle. Some also use electric burners with foil to slowly release umsi. I've even added it to hot water in a potpourri warmer and allowed the aroma to be gently released. Find the method that best works for you. Hey ladies, do you love the way your skin looks and feels? I know I do because I am using the I Am Melanin Magic Anti-Aging Serum. And at 50, I love the way my skin looks and feels. This blend is bomb. It renews, revitalizes, rejuvenates, soothes, conditions, moisturizes, tones, brightens, and fades all in one step. So if you're ready to get your glow on, go get you some. I am Melanie Magic, anti-aging serum.